Denis Villeneuve's two-film adaptation of Frank Herbert's iconic sci-fi epic Dune is now complete with the recent release of the second installment. The road to adapt this once-deemed unfilmable novel has been fraught with challenges for the release of both films, but after several delays, it finally debuted. In this video, I'd like to discuss my thoughts and opinions on Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 2, including what I enjoyed and what I take issue with. Spoiler warning if you haven't seen the film. As I anticipated early in the marketing campaign, my experience in seeing Dune Part 2 quickly became a mental tug of war between my lore brain and my experience as a general audience member. Going in, I came to terms with a level of cognitive dissonance and braced myself for the inevitable deviations from the source material. After all, Denis Villeneuve has maintained a clear stance on the regrettable necessity of such alterations, bemoaning the adaptation process as a violent act. Consequently, I'm left with a much higher opinion of Dune Part 2 strictly as a piece of entertainment versus what I'd consider it as an adaptation of the books. Starting with what I enjoyed most about the film, first and foremost, Austin Butler's Fadrotha steals the show in what is by far my favorite on-screen iteration of the character. He brought a level of intimidation and intensity that kept me on the edge of my seat. What particularly impressed me was how his role in the story seemed to remain faithful to the psychotic and ambitious spirit of the character as depicted in the book. Another aspect I thoroughly enjoyed in the film was Paul's transformation, the depiction of his internal struggles and his visions of the Fremen Jameis leading to his decision to incite the Fremen's Jihad was very well done. While the Jameis funeral scene was greatly trimmed down for the film, I appreciate Villeneuve's attempts to maintain his impact on Paul and Paul's increase in strength and capability felt genuine. Timothy stepped up into the role of Moadib, and he commanded the appropriate respect on screen. The final showdown between Fade and Paul was a cinematic spectacle that exceeded my expectations. Overall, the fact that Paul's rise to power and the disastrous consequences of that event were the focus of the film is the biggest relief as that's a core theme of Frank Herbert's book. If nothing else was preserved from the source material, that would be the most important theme to get right. I also found Beast Raban's storyline to be particularly engaging. His struggle to assert control over Arrakis felt realistic, and I'm glad Villeneuve took the time to showcase the struggle. Moreover, the relationship between Raban and Fade was chilling and fascinating and provided a nice insight into the dynamics of power within House Harkonnen. The atmosphere and cinematography of Getty Prime was nothing short of mesmerizing. It felt so stunningly otherworldly and foreboding, striking the exact kind of evil and sinister mood that belongs on the Harkonnen homeworld. As a fan of Greg Frazier's cinematography, I expected this film to be beautiful, and he did not disappoint. Every scene featuring the sandworms was a visual feast for the eyes, and in IMAX, the scale was massive, and each of the environments were immersive. The Baron also made a significant impression despite his brief appearances. He certainly takes a back seat to Fade as the primary antagonist, and rightfully so. That being said, I found his scenes on Getty Prime more compelling than those on Arrakis at the end, which to me felt rushed. There are some major alterations made to Lady Jessica's daughter Aaliyah from the book to film, as the timeline is compressed and by the end of the movie, she's still in utero. However, these changes are handled with finesse, and I appreciate Villeneuve's attempts to give Aaliyah a contribution that strives to stay true to the bizarre spirit of her character. Now on to the negative. Perhaps the biggest complaint I have about this film is with the changes that have been made to Chani and the lack of chemistry I felt between her and Paul. Throughout the film, Chani's character appears to oscillate between her role as Paul's lover and his most vocal skeptic. For me, this dichotomy ended up feeling disjointed and detracted from the authenticity of their relationship. Moreover, the rationale behind Chani's initial skepticism wasn't really explained outside of the idea that the Northern Fremen are less religiously motivated than the Southern Fremen. At a pivotal point in the movie, Paul is wrestling with the idea of going to the South where he fears that he will only catalyze the Fremen's Jihad. It's at this time that Chani professes her devotion to him, vowing to support him as long as he remains true to himself. However, following Paul's transformation from the Water of Life, any meaningful dialogue between him and Chani becomes conspicuously absent. 
While Paul makes a point to express his affection for her, Chani never really engages directly with him again regarding her apprehensions. Instead, she is seen directing her frustrations towards the Fremen, admonishing them for succumbing to these false prophecies. Throughout the remainder of the film, Chani adopts a brooding and disapproving attitude toward Paul with a distant and detached presence. The final moments of the film show her running away from Paul upon hearing the announcement of his intended marriage to Irulan. Due to the fact that I never felt any real chemistry between Paul and Chani, this moment fell flat for me. It was truly confusing that Chani felt more upset over this clearly loveless political alliance rather than the fact that her people were now leaving to engage in their holy war for Paul, who she recognizes as a false messiah. It makes absolutely no sense for her character as depicted in the film. Also, the fact that this moment is such a stark departure from the events of the book is another issue I have. At the end of the novel, Jessica assures Chani that this marriage is purely one of convenience and that Irulan will receive no affection from Paul, that history would remember Jessica and Chani as wives. The fact that the film deviated so far from this bittersweet moment of reassurance was a major letdown for me. It results in the film ending on an entirely bitter note that loses the nuance and ignores the true intention behind the marriage arrangement. This ties into another issue I have with the ending of the film, which revolves around the rationale provided in part two for Paul's Jihad. The film suggests that the rejection of Paul's claim to the throne by the Great Houses serves as the catalyst for the Holy War. However, this raises the question of why Paul still feels compelled to proceed with marrying Princess Irulan, which is solely intended to legitimize his rule. Chani's emotional exit and actions in the film's final shot are directly triggered by Paul's announcement of his intended marriage to Irulan. This union, however, is entirely unnecessary given the rejection of Paul's claim to the throne by the Imperium's Great Houses. Overall, this plot point felt convoluted to me, exacerbated by the fact that it serves as the film's conclusion. A few changes to the other supporting characters presented a challenge for me. For instance, Jessica seems to veer more towards being portrayed as an antagonist who is seemingly motivated by a hunger for power. She takes on a sort of villainous role within the Fremen as she actively manipulates Paul and stands in opposition to Chani's efforts to stomp out the flames of her people's growing zealotry. Additionally, Stilgar's character feels one-dimensional as it lacks the friendship with Paul that is such a big part of the book. Instead, he's reduced to a source of comic relief with his expressions of faith delivered in a way that elicited laughs in the audience. Outside of lore concerns, the portrayal of Stilgar in Dune Part 2 feels like a stark contrast to the more serious and solemn figure that had been established in Part 1. Paul's killing the Baron was another miss for me as it lacked the emotional weight or significance it deserved. Personally, I would have preferred it if Jessica had dispatched the Baron, perhaps motivated by her connection to Aaliyah from the womb. Apart from that, there were several other scenes and characters from the book that were noticeably absent or significantly shortened in the film. The portrayal of the Water of Life ceremony, for instance, felt underwhelming to me. I much preferred the way the sci-fi miniseries handled that scene rather than the minimalistic approach Vilnuf took. Prior to Dune Part 2, I was of the opinion that a miniseries format offered ample time to delve into aspects and plot points from the book that might be overlooked in a film adaptation. However, upon closer examination, I was surprised to learn that the combined runtime of Dune Parts 1 and 2 actually exceeds that of the entire three-part miniseries by almost an hour. So with that in mind, I had to take back my assumption that constraints of runtime in the film adaptations were solely responsible for certain changes. Instead, it became evident that these alterations and omissions of several subplots were deliberate artistic choices made by Villeneuve to streamline the adaptation to his vision, which I can respect. However, given everything we got in the miniseries, I'm sad to see just how much the film adaptation has left out from the book. There were several other characters such as Count Fenring, Thufir Howitt, and Spacing Guild members who were entirely omitted from the Dune sequel. 
Silver's total absence was especially surprising given actor Stephen McKinley Henderson's comments about his experience shooting scenes with Austin Butler's Fadrotha. Denis Villeneuve had also promised in the early stages of the film's development that Dune Part 2 would contain much more of the Mentat world. This obviously changed during the editing process, and knowing Villeneuve's stance on not releasing any deleted scenes, I'm left feeling sad that we'll never see any of Henderson's work for the sequel. One of the other minor grievances I have with the film is the lack of connection established between the sandworms and Spice. In the book, Paul's threat to the Spice revolves around his intimate knowledge of its source and production, granting him ultimate power over the Imperium. However, in the film, this aspect is greatly simplified, with Paul's threat merely being to nuke the Spice Reservoirs. This simplification ignores the intricate relationship between the Sandworms and Spice, as disrupting the Sandworms' life cycle is necessary to truly halt Spice production. From a lore standpoint, Paul's approach of nuking the spice doors wouldn't effectively end spice production, but aside from that, it takes away from the importance of the Fremen's connection to the desert and their intimate knowledge with the ecology of the planet and the processes responsible for spice production. Another letdown for me was Gurney's Balisset scene. This moment was hyped by Josh Brolin and Denis Villeneuve, with the director saying in an interview, The Gurney song survived part two. It became a weird priority for me, but Josh Brolin is a poet, and we played it together. It was awesome. However, Gurney's Balisset playing in part two ended up being a joke, with lyrics about a still suit filled with piss. Needless to say, this purposeful subversion of my expectations irritated me, as I was looking forward to seeing a serious depiction of the poetic and musical side of Gurney. I was left feeling like the director had trolled me for having the audacity to believe that we were going to get an awesome Balisset scene. The last issue that I'll highlight in this review is Fate's test with the Bene Gesserit pain box, which wasn't in the book. Considering his lack of Bene Gesserit training, I find it difficult to accept that Fade would have been able to survive this test. The explanation provided for this in the film is that Fade enjoys pain, which I guess could work, but I feel that this diminishes the significance of Paul's passing of the same test. It also undermines the entire point of the test, which is about one's ability to exercise self-control, which Fade very obviously does not have. Aside from his genetics, he's far too unstable to be used by the Bene Gesserit, so I just felt that the introduction of the pain box was an entirely unnecessary risk, as if he'd failed the test, they would have lost the bloodline, which took thousands of years to curate. While I have a few other minor nitpicks, I'll refrain from delving into them here. Overall, I want to emphasize that despite these flaws and deviations, Villeneuve delivers a thrilling cinematic experience. I truly feel that the director made the best, most believable version of Frank Herbert's universe that he could the only way he knew how. I applaud his team's effort, and I'm delighted to see a broad audience, both those who are familiar and unfamiliar with the books, embracing the film. Ultimately, like previous adaptations of Dune, I hope that this version inspires viewers to explore the books and delve into the captivating, deep, and intricate universe that Frank Herbert masterfully crafted. But I'm curious to know what you thought of Dune Part 2. Are there any parts that you particularly enjoyed or others that you took issue with? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy news and lore. And if you're looking for other ways to show your appreciation, you can check out my Patreon page where members get access to exclusive content and perks. Thank you all so much for your support. And as always, have a very nerdy day.